waves reverberating across the political world. The late development this evening surrounding Donald Trump's hush money trial and the developments in Trump's Georgia election fraud case. After the quote, tremendous lapse in judgment, the judge laid out against District Attorney Fonnie Willis. What happens next? We'll have the details. Plus, as Israeli families plead for the return of their loved ones still being held hostage by Hamas, it's not just bombs that have killed children in Gaza. Now, some are dying of hunger too. We'll speak with aid workers on the ground. And TikTok could be on the verge of being banned if the Senate has anything to say about it. The numbers behind the most popular app in the world and the former Trump official now putting together financing in a bid to buy it from China outright. Could he save the app for its millions of U.S. users? Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephanie Ramos, in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more. Including the path of destruction left behind in the Midwest after a deadly tornado outbreak tore through several counties. Plus, protests in Russia as voters there head to the polls for what's expected to be an easy win for Vladimir Putin. And would you be on board for a four-day work week? The senator proposing something we probably all can get behind this Friday night. But we begin with the major news in that Georgia election interference case against former President Donald Trump, a victory of sorts for District Attorney Fonnie Willis. The judge ruled today Willis can stay on the case if her former romantic partner Nathan Wade resigns. The judge made it clear that Willis showed a, quote, tremendous lack of judgment hiring Nathan Wade as the chief prosecutor for the case. The judge did not find a conflict of interest that harmed the defendant's case. Instead, Judge Scott McAfee gave Willis two choices. She and her entire staff could step down or Wade alone could resign from the case. Late today, Nathan Wade submitted his resignation, saying it was in the interest of democracy and to move this case forward as quickly as possible. And we are tracking a new development as well with Trump's hush money case right here in New York. More on that in a moment. But first, Aaron Katursky leads us off from Atlanta. How confident are you that the judge will find that there hasn't been a conflict of interest? Tonight, a judge in Georgia giving Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis a stark choice. She can keep leading the election interference case against Donald Trump only if her top prosecutor and former romantic partner steps down. Trump and several of his co-defendants fought to remove Willis, arguing she financially benefited by hiring Nathan Wade. But today, Judge Scott McAfee ruling the defendants failed to meet their burden of proving that the district attorney acquired an actual conflict of interest. The judge adding, Georgia law does not permit the finding of an actual conflict for simply making bad choices, even repeatedly. It's a win for the DA at a humiliating cost. Okay. The judge admonishing her for a tremendous lapse in judgment and criticizing her testimony as unprofessional. You're confused. You think I'm on trial. These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. He also rebuked Willis for a speech she gave in church, suggesting Wade only came under attack because he's black. I appointed three special counsel as is my right to do. Paid them all the same hourly rate. They only attack one. Judge McAfee said it was legally improper for Willis to cast racial aspersions. He also questioned her credibility on the witness stand and Wade's too, writing, an odor of mendacity remains. Ultimately, he determined the one-time romance created a significant appearance of impropriety. So if Willis is to stay on the case, her ex-boyfriend must go. And hours later, Nathan Wade was gone, submitting his resignation, saying he was doing it in the interest of democracy, in dedication to the American public, and to move this case forward as quickly as possible. Aaron Katursky joins us now. And Aaron, you are also following a development involving Trump's hush money trial here in New York. This is supposed to be former President Trump's first criminal trial, and it was supposed to begin on March 25th. But, Stephanie, tonight the judge has delayed that case. It's supposed to begin in nine days. Now it won't begin for at least a few weeks, mid-April at the earliest. And speaking of delays, back to Georgia. Bottom line, this whole episode has pushed the timeline of the trial back even more, right? 
Seems like it because the district attorney had wanted this case to start in August, but hard to see how that happens now. She just lost Nathan Wade, her top prosecutor, so she'll have to reset her entire prosecution team. Never mind Trump and the others may try to appeal today's ruling. And, and uh, then the judge hasn't even considered when to set a trial date. So still a lot of moving parts here, Stephanie. There certainly are. Aaron Katursky for us in Fulton County, Georgia. Aaron, thank you. Joining us now for more is ABC News contributor and Georgia RICO attorney Chris Timmons, who has worked alongside Fonnie Willis. Thanks so much for your time. Does this ruling take away Willis's credibility? It does, Stephanie, in the sense that a lot of the language in that order is scathing. I mean, I've never heard the term, what is it, uh, uh, odor of mendacity. Uh, he also suggested that her testimony during the hearing was unprofessional. Neither one of those things are things you want to hear when you're a prosecutor and you're reading over an order. So it does take away some of her credibility. It's still a win, though, and I don't think we want to take away from that in that, you know, she's able to proceed with the prosecution. Nathan Wade resigned today which means that, you know, she's able to go forward. And as long as there's no uh, appeal, which probably is unlikely in this case, uh, then I think she's going to be fine. And, and Fonnie Willis has responded to Wade's resignation, praising his for his professionalism. Despite being able to stay on this case, do you think she will step aside from this case following his resignation? I don't think she'll step completely aside. I do think she'll move to the background, though. Um, district attorneys in the state of Georgia, particularly in the larger counties, don't actually try cases. Uh, they have more of a bureaucratic role. They've got more of a managerial role. And so you haven't seen a ton of Fonnie Willis in this case. I mean, it seems like you've seen her because anytime anything big breaks, you know, she's had a press conference, but you haven't seen much of her in the courtroom outside of her actual testimony, which is what we're seeing now. Um, so when it came to arguing the motion, she's generally passed that off to other attorneys. And I think when we get to trial, even though she's a, an accomplished trial attorney and has the rare skill of having tried a RICO case before, I don't think she's going to be sitting at counsel table. I think she's going to go back to her role and let her very capable deputies and the two special prosecutors who remain in the case take the ball and move it forward. And Chris, former President Trump has also responded to the news on the platform Truth Social. If you were on Trump's team, would you be happy with this ruling? What, what do you think they're feeling right now because of this? I mean, I don't think they're happy with the ruling itself. I think they wanted to have... Uh, Bonnie Willis have to recuse herself or her disqualified, which would mean that the case would go into a prosecutorial limbo, be in no man's land. Um, and so if the case went into that no man's land, it would probably languish for months, if not years, before a new prosecutor stepped forward who would handle it. So from the standpoint that Willis remains on the case, it's a loss. But in terms of all the language and the scathing opinion of Judge McAfee in his ruling, I think it's a little bit of a win. Still, I think they're expected to appeal the case because delay favors them in this particular case. The closer they get to the election, then the less likely this case is to be tried before uh, the former president has an opportunity to be potentially elected in November. So I expect an appeal out of them. But at the same time, if you look at the order itself, you know, there's a previous order that came out a couple days ago with regard to six counts being dismissed from the indictment. And he wrote in that opinion that he would grant a certificate of immediate review, meaning he would grant an appeal of that. That There wasn't this same language in this particular order. And one of the requirements of appealing something like this that's before a final decision is that the judge has to agree. He has to issue that certificate of immediate review. The fact that he didn't put that language in this order suggests that he's not going to be amenable to ha having this order appealed. We will have to see what happens. Chris, you mentioned uh, earlier that Fonnie Willis may take more of a background role. What comes next overall for this case? So the next step, the very next step, is the, the decision by the defense whether to appeal or not. You know, there's a possibility that the state was going to appeal, but the fact that we got this resignation today from Nathan Wade suggests that the state's not planning to appeal. He resigned. There's no need for them to appeal at this point because Fonnie Willis stays on the case as a result of his resignation. So the next step is going to be the defense attorneys deciding whether they want to file an appeal. And it's an interlocutory appeal, as I mentioned, meaning that the judge has to approve it, but also the Georgia Court of Appeal 
appeals. We'll know within 10 days because it's a 10 day requirement for the judge to approve that appeal, whether that appeal goes up. So March 25th is going to be a big day and you should mark it on your calendar uh, for this particular Georgia case because we'll know on that date whether the judge approved the appeal or not. If he does nothing, it's still a choice. If he does nothing and doesn't rule on it, then that is the same as denying that interlocutory appeal request, meaning that the case won't go forward, uh, at least as far as an appeal is concerned. The case will be headed down the tracks towards trial. And Chris, please mark it on your calendar as well, because we will most likely have you back. Thanks so much uh, for your Looking insights. forward to it. Thanks so much, Thanks, Chris. Stephanie. Have a good weekend. Former Vice President Mike Pence says he cannot in good conscience endorse Trump in the upcoming 2024 presidential election. In an interview on Fox News with Martha McCallum, Pence pointed to profound differences on a range of issues for reasons to why he would not endorse the former president. He declined to reveal who he plans to vote for in November, but said he would never vote for President Biden. An urgent search after a deadly tornado outbreak. At least 14 confirmed tornadoes across seven states. At least three people losing their lives. Take a look at one of those tornadoes spotted ripping through Freiburg, Ohio. And just stunning damage from Lakeview, Ohio, hit by at least an EF3 with winds of more than 136 miles per hour. ABC's Alex Prache is in the storm zone for us tonight. Tonight, a desperate search for survivors after that deadly nighttime tornado outbreak. 14 confirmed tornadoes, cutting a path of destruction across seven states. At least three people killed, dozens injured. Those three deaths, all in Logan County, Ohio, where an EF3 tornado with winds of at least 136 miles per hour tore neighborhoods apart. Here in this lake community, you really get a sense of just how powerful this storm was. It didn't just snap trees over here. It also completely flipped this pontoon boat. This part should be all right. The tree. Blaine Schmidt showing us what's left of his Lakeview home. Schmidt riding out the tornado in his bathtub. Tonight, thankful his wife and two sons weren't home. Uh, it's just unreal. It's unreal. But you still have your family. Yeah, my family's everything important to me still here. The tornado's fury on full display. Look at this sighting here. It's wrapped around this power line like aluminum foil. There's two. Terrifying new video showing twin funnels touching down near Hancock County, Ohio. More than 100 homes damaged or destroyed across Indiana. And in southern Arkansas, more than half a foot of rain sparking life-threatening flash flooding. Back in Ohio, volunteers and first responders now helping the recovery effort. Authorities say rebuilding here will take time. I've been here pretty much my whole life. I've never seen anything this devastating. A trail of destruction left behind. Alex Prochet joins us now. Alex, we can see some of that debris behind you. How are the cleanup efforts going? Well, Stephanie, tonight you can really see just how much work they have left to do. This water is filled with debris behind me. One silver lining, though, that severe storm system has officially moved out of the region. Stephanie? That is certainly good to hear. Alex Prochet, thank you so much. New developments tonight in that rush hour subway shooting right here in New York City. Police say during an altercation, the aggressor was shot in the head with his own gun. And there are also new images tonight of the incident that sent terrified commuters running and ducking for cover. Here's Ariel Reshef. Let me out! Tonight, dramatic cell phone video of the mayhem. Just before that terrifying shooting in the New York City subway. A man seen here entering a Brooklyn subway station, evading the fare. Then on the train, threatening to fight a male passenger unprovoked. The confrontation boils over. Police now searching for this woman who in the video appears to stab the aggressor twice in the back. He eventually pulls a firearm out during that dispute and ultimately he's disarmed and shot with his own gun. Sources familiar with the investigation telling ABC News the assailant was shot four times, twice in the face, once in his neck, and once in his chest by the man he initially confronted. Let me out! Panicked passengers running for their lives. I don't think I was going to make it back home. 
Police swarming the scene within seconds, quickly taking the shooter into custody. Tonight, the man who instigated all of this in critical condition. Just days ago, New York Governor Kathy Hochul ordered the National Guard to patrol subway stations across the city. NYPD presence in the subway bolstered to levels not seen in decades. But still, subway crime up 13 percent so far this year. The Transit Bureau took six crimes, including the shooting. Six out of millions and millions of people that boarded this uh, our subway system yesterday. Ariel Reshev joins us now. Ariel, will a man who opened fire face any charges? Yeah, a lot of people wondering this, Steph. Well, the 32-year-old man who opened fire will not face charges because police say there is evidence of self-defense. Police also saying they've seized 17 guns in the New York City subway system so far this year. Steph? Thank you so much, Ariel, for that update. United Airlines says after landing in Medford, Oregon, it was discovered that an aircraft was missing an external panel. United says it was the wing to body fairing that ripped off. It's basically a shell located on the underside of the aircraft where the wing meets the aircraft body, just adjacent to where the landing gear deploys. It's not yet clear what the function of the panel was, if any, but for now, United says it will thoroughly examine the plane and perform repairs and conduct an investigation to figure out how the damage happened. The plane's following flight from Medford to Denver was canceled. Now to that new alert from Boeing advising airlines to inspect switches on certain pilot seats after a report of what might have caused a jet's sudden dive earlier this week. At least 50 people were injured, some hitting the roof, when a flight to New Zealand on Monday plunged unexpectedly in calm weather. ABC's Trevor Alt now on how a simple switch on a pilot seat might have triggered that midair scare. Tonight, a new alert from Boeing urging airlines to take action at the next maintenance opportunity, inspecting the switches on all cockpit seats on its 787 Dreamliner jets. The bulletin coming just days after this LATAM Airlines flight from Australia to New Zealand took a terrifying dive. Yeah, we just had some bad turbulence. Everyone's flying. The Wall Street Journal now reporting a possible cause, saying a flight attendant hit a switch on the pilot's seat while serving a meal, causing a motorized feature to push the pilot into the controls and push down the plane's nose. The dive sending passengers and crew flying out of their seats hard enough to crack the panels overhead. At least 50 people were injured. The other guy cut his arm pretty bad. Another guy hit his head through the plastic uh ceiling tiles, they broke. So you can see all the wires in the plane up above. People were screaming and shrieking and uh, in pain and in fright. The journal reporting Boeing told airlines in an overnight memo to look for loose covers on the switches and how to turn off power to the pilot seat motor if needed. And Stephanie, Boeing says that service bulletin about the seat switches was first issued back in 2017, but they wanted to remind airlines about it as a precautionary measure. Meantime, the NTSB is now assisting in the investigation into that LATAM Airlines incident. Stephanie. Across Russia, voters are casting ballots for an election expected to give Vladimir Putin another six-year term. Election monitors do not consider the contest free or fair. And though voting has been mostly peaceful, there have been some cases of vandalism. Here's Lama Hassan. Tonight, President Vladimir Putin is said to have cast his ballot online, all but certain to win a fifth term. One month after the death of his main political rival, Alexei Navalny, in an Arctic penal colony, he faces no serious challengers. Navalny's widow, Yulia, has called for protests this weekend. Several cases of vandalism reported at polling locations. This polling station set on fire in southwest Russia. This woman repeatedly throwing a Molotov cocktail at a voting site in St. Petersburg. And across the country, protesters pouring green liquid into ballot boxes. An apparent nod to Navalny, who in 2017 had an attacker throw green disinfectant on his face. Stephanie, Putin stands to win another six years in office, having first been elected in 2000. And he's already planned a victory celebration for this coming Monday, one day after voting ends. Stephanie.
Lama Hassan for us. Thank you so much. After more than 20 years, the Congo has reinstated the death penalty, according to a justice ministry statement released this week. This comes as authorities there struggle to curb violence and militant attacks by 120 armed groups plaguing the country. The statement went on to say that the ban that began in 2003 allowed those accused of treason and espionage to get away without severe punishment. A landmark legal settlement could bring about the biggest changes to the U.S. housing market in decades. A powerful realtors group has agreed to eliminate rules for paying broker's fees. But what does this all mean? Let's bring in ABC's Elizabeth Schulze. Elizabeth, this could change the way Americans buy and sell homes. It really could, Stephanie. This is a $418 million settlement that could slash the price that Americans pay when they are buying or selling a home. So typically, real estate brokers will charge automatically 6% commission on the price of a home sale. Now, under these new changes that were agreed to by the National Association of Realtors, those commission fees will be negotiated lower or eliminated altogether. So for a $400,000 home, that is the median home price about in the U.S., that could theoretically save the seller as much as $24,000 in fees. This could also force more brokers to leave the industry if this settlement is approved as it's expected to be by a federal court. Those changes will take effect mid-July. Stephanie. Certainly a significant change if it happens. Elizabeth Schulze for us in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thanks. A massive fire gutted actress Cara Delevingne's home in Los Angeles. The fire broke out overnight, flames spreading through the house. The roof collapsed, you can see it there. Nearly 100 firefighters responded to this, and at least two people were injured. Delevingne, known for her roles in Paper Towns and Suicide Squad, was not home at the time. She's performing in London. We still have much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, we tell you why Uber and Lyft might leave one major Midwest city. But up next, we head to the Middle East for the latest on the crisis facing children in Gaza. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. You have another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag is not okay, it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. We're in Miami to check out a golf tournament that's loud, pouty, and controversial. We've got exclusive access. We are about to party. We're not from the country club. We love the game of golf. We're trying to have fun with it. Sports washing is a form of information manipulation. When you do something wrong as a political regime, you can't just get rid of the stain. Power play, the booming business of sports washing. Now streaming on Hulu.
major developments tonight in the Israel-Hamas war. Israel's war cabinet approving a plan to go after Hamas militants in the southern Gaza city of Rafah. But the plan would require the evacuation of 1.4 million displaced Palestinians who have taken refuge there. And this all comes as the first shipment of desperately needed aid has arrived in Gaza by sea. Our Matt Gutman is in Israel tonight. Tonight, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announcing plans for that controversial offensive into the southern Gaza city of Rafah to hunt for Hamas. The IDF says it would move 1.4 million Palestinians to humanitarian islands in central Gaza. They will provide them temporary housing, food, water, fill hospitals. But U.S. officials say they've seen no plan. We have to see a clear and implementable plan, not only to get uh, civilians out of harm's way, but also to make sure that once out of harm's way, they're appropriately cared for. Amid a growing rift with Netanyahu, President Biden today praising Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's blistering rebuke of the Israeli leader. I think he uh, expressed a serious concern shared not only by him, but by many Americans. Today, the first maritime shipment of aid arriving off the coast of Gaza but distribution of the aid remains a challenge. The hunger is killing us, said this man. I'm still going to go to Rafa so I can eat and feed my children. But Rafa may not be a refuge for much longer. Stephanie, Hamas has presented a new proposal, and it would see the release of about 40 Israeli hostages, uh, women, minors, the elderly and ill, released in exchange for between seven to 1,000 Palestinians who are being held in Israeli prisons. Now, Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu has called that unrealistic, but still, tonight, he has sent a delegation to Doha for negotiations. This is a step forward. In fact, U.S. officials are saying this is probably the most significant progress that we have seen in talks in weeks. Stephanie. Matt Gutman for us there in Israel. Thank you. With us now is UNICEF spokesperson Joe English. Joe, thank you for your time tonight. UNICEF, of course, is the UN agency working desperately in Gaza to supply those in need with food, water, and medical supplies. Joe, as our correspondent in Israel, Matt Gutman, just reported, aid distribution remains a challenge. What obstacles is UNICEF running into? Yeah, good to you, Stephanie. I mean, I think at any point when we're talking about the how of delivering aid, I think, first of all, we need to remind ourselves why. Children are reportedly starving to death in Gaza. They are wasting away before their parents' eyes because of a lack of, of nutrition and a lack of clean water. Now, this shouldn't be happening anywhere in the world, and it certainly shouldn't be happening, you know, in some places less than 10, 15, 20 miles from somewhere where, where humanitarian assistance is, is there, it's ready, it's waiting. We have to see an end to the fight and we have to see a release of the hostages and we have to be allowed to get in and do our job as we do in conflicts all around the world. We know how to do this, we know how to save lives, we have to be allowed to. It really is so awful that these children have to suffer in this way. Let's say you are able to get aid where it needs to go. How hard has it been to distribute it once it's there? It has been incredibly difficult to distribute. I mean, one of the reasons, and, and many of us have seen the images of, of families who are, you know, besides the, beside themselves with desperation. And part of the reason is that the, the aid deliveries that have gone in have been sporadic. They've been rare. They haven't been consistent. And that's why we don't just call for access, but we call for continued regular access, because families need to be confident that the delivery that, come, that is coming today will not be the only delivery in the next couple of weeks, that we'll be able to get in today and tomorrow and the day after. And the most simple, effective is through road access. The situation is certainly worse. And in operating in such dangerous conditions, you, of course, have to prioritize. What are UNICEF's top priorities right now? Right now, it has to be it has to be nutrition supplies for children, and it has to be safe drinking water. You know, we are providing families with the absolute bare essentials of life. You know, and when I speak to my colleagues and when we speak to parents, you know, that is their only priority at the moment: is waking up each day, ensuring that their child is still alive when they go to bed. Absolutely, and, and seeing their faces, we've seen some of the images uh, of, the, of the children that are going through through this hardship. It's heartbreaking to see them going through this. An estimated 17,000 children have lost one or both parents in Gaza. 
How does that alone complicate getting aid and getting assistance to them? You know, it really does, you know, but as I say, we, we work in conflicts all around the world. You know, in Syria, it's been 13 years of conflict now, in Yemen, almost nine years, and we work with children who are unaccompanied or separated. We work with children who have lost both of their parents, and we know how, you know, through love and affection and care and services and all of these things that any parent, any caregiver, you know, wants and hopes for their child, that we can help them begin to rebuild the pieces of, of their shattered lives. But that has to start with an end to the fighting. You mentioned uh, Syria. They've been in conflict for 13 years, and we know that UNICEF attempts to help suffering children in places like Syria, Somalia, South Sudan. Are the children of Gaza facing a situation just as bad? They are. You know, I, I think I take it back to, to an individual level. Think of an individual child. You know, think of an individual parent who is waking up, you know, with the scenes that we are seeing right now on the screen. And imagine trying to protect your child from that, trying to explain your to, to your child what is going on. I don't think any of us can truly comprehend that. You know, and, and the, the levels of starvation that we're seeing, the levels of malnutrition that we're seeing, and we know how to treat children like this. We have the tools at our disposal. We just have to be able to reach them. We cannot say it enough. It has to end. If a ceasefire can be negotiated, and, and of course it's a big if right now, how long does UNICEF see itself working in Gaza? How much longer can you all continue there? We will not stop. You know, we have been in Gaza for many, many, many decades, and we will be there during the fighting. We will be there once the guns finally, thankfully, fall silent. And we will be there to support this generation of children, you know, many of whom, you know, this is not their first time of, of going through conflict. You know, there are a generation of children with psychosocial scars that will need dedicated services and support to begin to process, to begin to be able to, you know, rebuild their lives, their communities and, and their country. And, and UNICEF will be there every step of the way. It's an absolutely heartbreaking situation and, and so thankful that UNICEF and yourself are putting the work in and not giving up. Really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you so much for sharing about your, your efforts and, and the work that you're doing in so many different uh, nations. UNICEF spokesperson Joe English, thank you. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Still ahead here on Prime, after Pierce Brosnan ordered to pay $1,500 after pleading guilty, we tell you why. And is time running out for TikTok? As a possible ban looms, we do a deep dive into the app by the numbers. We're in Miami to check out a golf tournament that's loud, howdy, and controversial. We've got exclusive access. We are about to party. We're not from the country club. We love the game of golf. We're trying to have fun with it. Sports washing is a form of information manipulation. When you do something wrong as a political regime, you can't just get rid of the stain. Power play, the booming business of sports washing, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You should see me Strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey, the queens. You should see me in a crowd. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane. Celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Yeah, you 
Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Jordy. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2, only on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I'm Medea Villarreal in Houston, Texas. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming with ABC News Live. Former Trump-era Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin made news Thursday saying he planned to form an investor group to buy TikTok. This after the House passed a bill saying TikTok's Chinese owners must sell the social media company or face a possible ban. Who actually uses the app and what is it worth? That's our by the numbers. Analysts say TikTok could sell for $50 billion if spun from its parent company, ByteDance. But we're nowhere near that point. TikTok first trying to appease U.S. regulators, offering to spend $1.5 billion just to wall off user data from the prying eyes of any foreign entity. And even if the Senate were to take up the bill, 60 votes would be needed to break the current filibuster. Americans themselves are torn. As we've reported here on Prime, approximately one third of all adults polled by the Associated Press were at least somewhat opposed to a ban. Another third was indifferent, and only the final third was strongly or somewhat in favor of any ban. After all, roughly 5 million businesses, most of them small, use TikTok to market themselves and sell mer merchandise. Those sales amounting to $14.7 billion last year alone. That's according to an Oxford business study. And according to Pew survey, 15% of U.S. adults even say they now get their news regularly from TikTok, up from just 3% in 2020. And we still have much more to get to here on Prime. Olivia Rodrigo is making sure her fans stay protected as she tours. And we are one month away from tax day. Do you have everything in order or are you scrambling? We tell you what you need to get the best return. That's coming up. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. And the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live.
the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Prince William and his brother Harry appear separately at an awards show. A squid game actor convicted of sexual harassment and a bus driver rescues a lost toddler. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. The Minneapolis City Council has approved a $1.40 per minute minimum wage for rideshare drivers operating within the city limits. Both Uber and Lyft have said that if the ordinance does take effect, they'll pack up and leave. The ordinance approved by the Minneapolis City Council imposes a $5 minimum per trip plus $1.40 per mile. The rideshare companies say they're being priced out of the market. Minneapolis rideshare users will find out on May 1st when the new minimum wage is set to take effect. Fallout after pop star Olivia Rodrigo handed out free condoms and emergency contraceptive pills at a concert in St. Louis, Missouri. According to Variety, Rodrigo's team decided to no longer give away contraceptives because, quote, children are present at the concerts. The giveaway was coordinated with local groups that support reproductive rights. After Roe v. Wade was overturned, Missouri banned abortion with no exceptions for rape. This after Rodrigo recently launched her own nonprofit called Fund for Good. Um, a portion of all of the proceeds from the ticket sales of the Guts World Tour will go to the Fund for Good, which I'm very excited about. The goal of the nonprofit is to support organizations that, quote, champion girls' education, support reproductive rights, and prevent gender-based violence. New signs of trouble for the royal family. Prince William and his brother Harry appearing at the Diana Awards, an event honoring their mother, but choosing not to appear together. William made his appearance in person, delivering remarks and then leaving before Prince Harry appeared virtually from California. My mum would be incredibly proud of all the work that you've done. This as the fallout from the royal photo scandal and confusion surrounding Princess Kate's health plagues the family. The AFP now saying Kensington Palace are absolutely not considered a trustworthy source. That after they put out this doctored photograph of Kate and her children. South Korean actor Oh Young Soo, who starred in the first season of the hit Netflix series Squid Game, was charged with two counts of sexual harassment. The actor was sentenced to eight months in prison, suspended for two years, and will have to attend a sexual violence treatment program. The 79-year-old actor, who won the Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actor in 2022, denies accusations and told reporters he plans to appeal against the decision. Even though the National Park Service signs clearly say you got to remain in the designated areas of the park because other parts can be dangerous, last November, 70-year-old Pierce Brosnan walked out right in front of a geyser and snapped his photo and posted it on his Instagram page. This week, Brosnan pleaded guilty to foot travel in a Yellowstone thermal area. He was fined $500. He'll pay a Yellowstone charity another thousand, and he's promised not to do it again. Milwaukee County Transit bus driver Keon Finkley behind the wheel driving along Capitol Drive in Milwaukee. I had sunglasses on, so when I seen it, I was, my eyes got big, like, okay, 
Am I dreaming? <laughs> this is what Finkley saw, a boy about four to five years old darting across the road. The boy was barefoot and wearing only a pajama shirt. Stay right there, don't move. Finkley stopped the bus and brought him on board to keep him warm. Finkley called dispatch, which then notified police. Officers then took the boy and reunited him with his family. Miami Beach is bracing for a chaotic weekend with spring break colliding with St. Patrick's Day. Police already deploying extra officers and setting up DUI checkpoints across that city. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimbert. Miami Beach put to the test. This weekend is really, uh, yes, it's historically been our, been our toughest weekend. After years of spring breakers wreaking havoc on this small island, officials are looking to curb the chaos with arguably the toughest restrictions yet, including DUI checkpoints, $100 parking, bag checks, $500 towing fees, and now all parking garages will be closed to visitors. More than a dozen drones will be patrolling overhead, 140 plus state troopers and even the Coast Guard deploying to help local police. Miami Beach Commissioner David Suarez says this season is different. Every year there was always a shooting and there was always a death. And and it's sad, and that's, that's not Miami Beach. We need to talk. It started with a now viral ad with more than 200 million views and counting. Until then. We're breaking up with you. Leaders say the crackdown is working. There were nearly 600 spring break related arrests last year and two deaths compared to roughly 200 arrests and zero fatalities this year. We needed to end spring break. We're bringing back law and order. But some vacationers say it's all a bit much. It's really overwhelming. Like the heavy police presence is just too overwhelming. Our thanks to Andrew. Officials are investigating if college student Riley Strain was overserved before his disappearance in Nashville last Friday. The 22 year old was seen by his friends last Friday night after drinking in Nashville's Broadway area when he was kicked out of country singer Luke Bryan's bar. New surveillance video shows Strain falling on a sidewalk and stumbling down the street shortly before he disappeared. The TC restaurant group who operates Luke Bryan's bar released a statement saying our thoughts are with his family and loved ones for his safe return. Our next guest has been fighting for equality and justice for most of her life. Dr. Seema Samar has made a name for herself across Afghanistan and the world as an educator of the marginalized and defender of human rights. She details her inspiring journey as a medical doctor, public official, Nobel Peace Prize nominee, and a thorn in the side of the Taliban in her memoir, Outspoken, My Fight for Freedom and Human Rights in Afghanistan. Dr. Seema Samar is joining us now. Welcome to Prime. So great to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You've stayed in the spotlight as a lifelong advocate for girls and women, equality and justice. Why did you decide now was the time to finally share your story in this book, which I have right here? Yes. Thank you so much for having the book and uh, thank you for asking this question. Um, well, I was busy before that, so I thought that uh, this is a time to, to write the book. And it was after the collapse of the regime, I am forced to stay in the U.S. And I had time. I would like to also thank the Harvard University and also Fletcher School at Taft University, who gave me the possibility and facilitate that I was able to write that book. And I wanted to do that because I wanted the young girls in Afghanistan to to know that it's uh, um, everything is possible. It's not impossible if they have commitment, they can do uh, and reach to the uh, to the dream that they have. Now, since the late 1970s, you've been resistant to the dangerous regimes that plagued your home country. You lost your husband. Sorry about that, and other members of his family, but. Despite that, you have continued to evolve into a force and advocate for the oppressed. How did it feel reflecting on, on everything that you've done over the last uh, couple of decades? Yeah, it was not easy. It was quite difficult and it's still very difficult. But when I look back that I helped some families, some women who survived because of my um, when I was practicing health, and also uh, I see the girls and the young boys who got educated and they were able to go to the schools that I established. It gives me more courage to continue that. And I have to say also that I, I'm proudly saying that I was the at least behind the whole introduction of human rights in my country in Afghanistan.
And I also wanted to say that Afghanistan is not only uh, what media portray. And, and you, you mentioned courage. You've had so much courage. Does looking back on all of this also help you look forward at what you still want to accomplish? Yes, I think it is. And I'm, as I said, that I'm happy that I was uh, able to promote human rights and protect human rights in Afghanistan during the last 20 years. But uh, I keep saying that uh, the knowledge that I give to the people, the awareness that I give to the own human rights to them, uh, and uh, that is something that I'm so hopeful. No matter how dark is the night, uh, the sun will come up next morning and it will be dawn. So hopefully that will be also in Afghanistan. And I also want to say that, unfortunately, Afghanistan is a collective failure of uh, Afghan people, Afghan government, and also the international community. And there is an obligation of all of us to uh, promote and protect human rights in Afghanistan, and particularly women's rights in the country. And you've done so much for women and girls through your organization, Shahada. And you're also the chair of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. From, from 2002 to, to 2019, you were the chair. You not only introduced the concept of human rights to your people, but you sought accountability and justice from those who violated them. What is the current state of affairs in the country for women and girls? And do you see yourself going back at some point? Uh, I'm dreaming to go back as soon as uh, as the situation permit. Uh, yes, I think the unfortunately it's a devastating situation of human rights in the country and humanitarian situation is really really dire. Uh, and I think that uh, the the continuation of the culture of impunity is very very common in Afghanistan. The previous government collapsed because what we did in the in the Bonn Agreement after 9/11. We had the, we put the roadmap for the future of Afghanistan, for a new beginning for Afghanistan. But what was missing was accountability and justice for violation of human rights in commission of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Humanity, and it continues, unfortunately. Thank you so much for your time tonight. You can learn more about her incredible story in her memoir, Outspoken, My Fight for Freedom and Human Rights in Afghanistan, available wherever books are sold. Today, Senator Bernie Sanders introduced the 32-hour Work Week Act in an attempt to get Americans closer to a four-day work week. The bill would be implemented over a four-year period, reducing Americans' working hours while allowing them to keep their current income. Sanders argued it would increase productivity, while Republicans said the reduction could hurt employers and cause a spike in consumer prices. The act also outlined concerns about automation, such as AI. We're just one month away from the tax filing deadline. Before you grab your W-2 and get started, there are some things you might want to know. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus joins us now with the details. Alexis, there have been rumors online that refunds are getting lower, but what can the average person expect to see this year? I'm here to tell you the rumors are wrong. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm going to give you some know. good news when it comes to the IRS and taxes. We don't get a lot of it, but here you go. The average tax refund about 10% higher this year really? at just under $3,500. Big reason why is last year a lot of those pandemic era tax benefits had expired and so that lowered the overall um, refund and then this year the IRS made some changes to the standard deduction. They changed the tax brackets to uh, to reflect inflation and so we're getting a nice bump up in our refund. And it's even though the tax deadline is right around the corner it's not too late to save. What are some last minute ways we can lower our 2023 tax bill? Absolutely there is still time folks to do this. So if you did not max out your traditional IRA, you have until April 15th to do that. The max is $6,500, $7,500 if you're uh, over 50. Uh, and also make sure you are taking all of the tax credits that are eligible, that you're eligible for, like the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. And what about gig workers who are getting paid through apps like Venmo or PayPal? What do they need to know when they're filing? Yeah, so their taxes are going to get a little more complicated next year. The IRS was going to come out with these new rules this year. They're moving them to next year. So this year, if you got paid through a third-party app like Venmo or PayPal, you only have to fill out a 1099K form is what it's called if you made $20,000 over those apps and had 200 transactions. Beginning when you file your 2024 taxes this time next year, that threshold drops 
drops to $600. So a lot of folks will be filling out those 1099K forms come next year. All right, good to keep that in mind. Okay, so Congress, they approved an $80 billion boost to the IRS over the next decade as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. So what new services is, is that supporting? They're putting that money to good use. Um, first off, if you're getting a letter from the IRS, hopefully you're not, but if you are and they're telling you there was an error with your taxes or you owe money, they're promising those letters will be in plain English and not in jargon. So we're gonna hopefully be able to understand correspondence coming from the IRS. They're also opening up a lot more um, service centers for in-person help with your taxes. And just launched a few weeks ago is Direct File. It's only a pilot program out in 12 states, including New York and California, but you can go right Right to the IRS website and fill out your federal taxes for free if you have simple taxes. Depending on how that launch goes, we could see direct file rollout nationwide in the next couple of years. Okay, and, and what I appreciate <laughs> from the IRS is that if you're missing like that child tax credit, for instance, if you didn't get it last year or whenever you didn't file it, they know they keep everything organized. Like they'll send, they'll send it to you. I mean, that happened to us. We didn't fly, we didn't add that in. Isn't that and then nice? All of a sudden, so they said, hey. Hey. they said, hey, by the way, you're you're owed this. You're eligible. Yeah. Is there anything else that that is something that you've seen where the IRS is like okay this is something that you were missing kind of similar to the child tax credit? You know, credit. there is the American uh, Opportunity Tax Credit, and that's for college expenses that both a, a student and a parent can take. So it's those kinds of credits, you know, either either look them up yourself or ask your tax professional because you may be eligible, even eligible to take some deductions. If you're a school teacher, for instance, you can deduct up to $300 worth of supplies that you bought out of pocket. That's right, that's right, really great to know. Alexis, thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> time to do our taxes. I gotta do it this weekend. Do it, it's time. yes. It's time, Yeah, I've done mine, but I should. I'm the business reporter. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks so much. Sure. Well, here's another way parents can keep money in their pockets. With high schoolers across the country getting ready for prom, one nonprofit in North Carolina is helping those looking for that dress, giving them away free of charge. Reporter Amber Rapinta from our partner station WTVD has this story in tonight's local lowdown. We organize them by color. As prom season approaches, a Franklin County nonprofit, the Hope Chest, is helping students in need of a dress with an upcoming prom dress giveaway. The Hope Chest started back in 2015. Jennifer and Voldson's daughter Jordan started the organization, and it all began as her senior project. She took her love of dresses and her experience in foster care of not having things, and she combined those. Jordan's inspiration to give back came from being adopted out of the foster care system, remembering how she she felt when she had nothing. The first year we collected about 75 dresses. These local high schools out here in Lewisburg, they were busing the children all the way to the event at the church in Apex. In 2020, we decided it was just too much. We got the 501c3 status and started fundraising. These are our shorter dresses that people have donated. In 2020, the Hope Chest became a nonprofit, and this year it has a thousand dresses to give out. Kids get bullied all the time for not having the money, for being adopted, for being too fat, being too thin. As a therapist and social worker, I see the, the pain on these girls' faces. So being able to give back to the community and actually empower these girls and make them feel good about themselves, it's just what makes it great. Great partnerships now helping the nonprofit's mission. We partner with Wake Forest Coffee Company. Last year, we partnered with Pine Hill Pavilion. They donate the use of their venue. It's a beautiful wedding venue. And this year, the venue will once again host the event, helping hundreds find the perfect prom dress at no cost. We have an average of 100 girls per event, so that's about 200 girls per year. And it's all thanks to one student's idea to give back. What a great story. Our thanks to Amber Rupinta with WTVD. Guys, that is our show for tonight. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great weekend.